Yo, yo, I'm Jovan Buha, Lakers beat writer for The Athletic, and welcome to another Lakers postgame reaction show. I just got back from Crypto.com Arena, where the Lakers beat the Cleveland Cavaliers 116 to 97 to improve to 45 and 33 and retake the number eight seed for the first time since December 29th, 2023, 98 days ago. It has been over three months since the Lakers have been in the top eight in the West, and they are finally back uh, after having won nine of 10 games, including four in a row. As I talked about with Jason Timpf on episode 10 of Buha's Block, uh, my podcast, uh, the Lakers, like the one knock on their recent play uh, was they had not beaten many teams above 500. On that road trip, they went 5-1, and one, uh, but only one win was against an above 500 team. During that 8 out of 9 stretch entering today's game, uh, only two of those teams had been above 500. Uh, technically three, but I wasn't counting the Philadelphia 76ers since uh, they were nine games under 500 without Joel Embiid and the lineup. So looking at that stretch, if you wanted to poke a, a slight hole in it, the one thing you could say was the Lakers hadn't really beaten many good teams. Now, the flip side to that argument, of course, is that the Lakers had played a tougher schedule beforehand because they had not been playing as many lottery level teams. But that argument doesn't apply today because the Cleveland Cavaliers were a team that is playing for something right now. They're in that battle for the three seed in the East. Uh, they were coming off a disappointing loss to the Phoenix Suns, uh, and they haven't been playing their best basketball as of late, they were 11 and 15 uh, over their last 26 games entering this game, uh, but they're still a team that has a better record than the Lakers, even after today's results. Even with them not playing as well recently, this was one of the Lakers' best wins uh, during the stretch. You know, I'd probably put it number two uh, behind the win over the Milwaukee Bucks. And not only did this push the Lakers into the number eight spot temporarily, they have a half game lead over the Kings, they have one more win. Uh, Sacramento does have the tiebreaker, so that could come into play depending on how things uh, go down the stretch here. But in addition to that, they are 21 and eight now since February 1st, which to me was one of the turning points in the season. That was their win in Boston without Anthony Davis and LeBron James. They're coming off those disappointing losses to the Rockets and the Hawks. And since that point, they are 21 and eight, which is tied for the best record in the West with the Dallas Mavericks and the second best record overall behind just the Boston Celtics. So LA is peaking at the right time for the second straight season. We've seen this group struggle coming back from a road trip. Uh, and, and they this was their first 1230 start home game of the season. Uh, like I'm still recovering from the road trip. I'm super tired. I can only imagine how they feel. And for them to come out, play an early game, and play rather well for most of the game outside of a terrible stretch in the first half of the third quarter, this was just an impressive win for the Lakers. And it puts them in a really good spot now to get into the 7-8 game. And then once you're there, uh, I mean, maybe they move up to 7, maybe they stay at 8. But if they can stay in that 7-8 game, they have a shot to get the number 7 seed and avoid playing the Denver Nuggets in round one. And not only that, but position themselves on the opposite side of the bracket. And that's of course, assuming Denver gets the number one seed, which is far from a certainty, although they technically have an easier remaining schedule than the Minnesota Timberwolves and the Oklahoma City Thunder. And things are trending in a positive direction for the second straight season. All right, you guys know the drill. Let's get into some of the box score numbers and then we'll do our three takeaways. So D'Lo led the Lakers with 28 points, including 23 in the first half. It was his second highest scoring half of the season, uh, only behind that 28 point second half he had against the Milwaukee Bucks uh, earlier in March. He started this game nine for 11, including five for seven on threes. It was just a typical D'Lo flamethrower game. And when he's making the types of shots that he makes, it's not only debilitating for a defense from a confidence perspective, uh, but it, it really unlocks the best parts of LeBron and AD offensively. AD had 22 points, 13 rebounds, three steals, and six blocks. Three steals and six blocks is just absolutely ridiculous. Uh, an incredible defensive performance from AD. He was bothering everybody on Cleveland. By the second half, uh, Karis LeVert, Donovan Mitchell, Darius Garland, they were scared getting into the paint and trying to finish around him. Uh, even the bigs at times were, were second guessing. Uh, like he, he got Jared Allen a couple times and it was just like, this was a very disruptive Anthony Davis game. 
and the, the type of game that single-handedly raises LA's defensive ceiling. LeBron was locked in from the jump. He had 24 points and 12 assists. Uh, what was really uh, picking his spots and getting downhill, leveraging Cleveland's defense against them and creating open looks for shooters and cutters. Austin Reeves only had seven points and six assists, but he did a really good job on Donovan Mitchell. I'm gonna to touch on the Lakers perimeter defense in one of my takeaways, but Austin has really stepped up as the de facto perimeter stopper among the starting group and has done a really solid job, uh, not only today against Donovan Mitchell, but in previous weeks against Shea Gilgis Alexander, De'Aaron Fox, Steph Curry, like Austin is taking on these seemingly impossible matchups and holding his own from a numbers perspective. A lot of those guys had off shooting nights with Austin as the primary guy. So we've seen Austin take a little bit of a back seat offensively. You know, D'Lo continues to often be the third leading scorer. Uh, Rui has taken on a bit of a larger role offensively, but Austin's become more the dirty work guy where he's, he's rebounding really well. Uh, he, he's playmaking at a high level and he's taking on difficult defensive matchups and holding his own. Like good offense will always beat good defense, but Austin has been really, really solid on that end. Rui had an uncharacteristic performance offensively, was just never in a rhythm, seven points on, on three for nine shooting. Torian Prince led the bench with 18 points and four threes. He got really hot and helped the Lakers uh, in key parts of the second quarter and third quarter hitting big shots. And Spencer Dinwiddie and Gabe Vincent didn't do much offensively. They combined for six points on just two of seven and shooting, uh, but they did a great job defensively locking into Darius Garland, Donovan Mitchell, and Karis LeVert. Jackson Hayes had a couple dunks and a couple blocks, including a dunk kind of on Gabe Vincent. Uh, it was offensive rebound, running put back that the type of play only Jackson can make. The Lakers shot 56.3%. They made 16 threes and shot 43% on threes. And they also won a game where they turned the ball over a lot. They had 17 turnovers, including several in the third quarter that led to Cleveland getting back into this. And they also only made 10 of 16 free throws. So not a lot of attempts, a poor percentage, but yet they still found a way to win this game by almost 20 points. Uh, but without further ado, let's get into our three takeaways from today's game. Takeaway number one is the 7-8 game is officially realistic. Takeaway number one is the 7-8 game has become realistic for the Lakers. And that's been the case for uh, a couple weeks now. But with the Sacramento Kings losing to Boston last night and the New Orleans Pelicans losing to the San Antonio Spurs, there was an opening for the Lakers uh, entering Saturday's game. And they took advantage of it. And of course, we'll see how the next four games go. Uh, the Lakers have to go at least three and one, uh, I think, to secure the, the number seven or, or number eight spot, depending on what happens with uh, the, the other teams in the West. Uh, but I, I look at the Minnesota game uh, as a very important game, not only an opportunity for the Lakers to get closer to number seven or number eight, but also an opportunity to knock the Timberwolves down and make it more likely that the Denver Nuggets get the number one seed, uh, which if the Lakers can then secure the number seven seed, puts them on the opposite side of the bracket and gives them, in my opinion, a realistic shot to go on another run and potentially make the conference finals again. Then they have a critical matchup with Golden State on Tuesday. If they win that game, they win the season series and all but guarantee that Golden State will be the number 10 seed unless Sacramento or New Orleans completely collapses here down the stretch. It is worth noting again that the Kings have the tiebreaker over the Lakers. They swept the season series. So if the Kings win their next game and have the same record as the Lakers, they will move back up to number eight and LA will fall down to number nine. And a quick glance at Tankathon. I have the numbers here. The Suns still have the third toughest remaining schedule. Uh, they play the Timberwolves, the Clippers twice, the Pelicans, and the Kings. The Lakers have the 10th toughest schedule. They play the Timberwolves, the Warriors, the Grizzlies, and the Pelicans. And then the Pelicans and Kings uh, have the 13th and 14th toughest remaining schedules, uh, respectively, with the Pelicans playing the Suns, the Lakers, the Kings, the Warriors, and the Blazers, and the Kings playing the Thunder, the Suns, the Pelicans, the Blazers, and the Nets. So looking at it, uh, technically, the Kings have the, the easiest remaining schedule of these teams. The Warriors technically have the seventh easiest schedule overall, but they are so far behind the pack that uh, it would likely take the Lakers losing to the Timberwolves and losing to the Warriors for the Warriors to have a realistic shot to jump them. But that 
scenario aside, uh, it's looking more and more like it's going to come down to the Lakers versus the Pelicans uh, for that uh, number eight spot. And that's assuming uh, the Suns continue to win at the pace. Like the Suns have been playing really well. Uh, It's looking like they're probably going to be the sixth seed. Then it's a matter of the Kings, the Pelicans, and the Lakers. Uh, But the the Kings have a little bit more margin for error. They almost have two shoe-in wins against the Nets and the Trailblazers. Uh, So if they can go at least three and two down the stretch, I think it's going to be hard for the Lakers to jump them. Uh, So the Lakers against the Pelicans, uh, it sets up an interesting scenario where those two teams are are not only jockeying for positioning, but they play each other in the regular season finale in New Orleans in a game that could end up determining the seven seed, the eight seed, or the nine seed, or or all three seeds. Uh, So fascinating stuff here down the stretch. But for the first time, uh, like the, the Lakers, again, 21 and eight since February 1st, yet they had not moved in the standings. They had been flip flopping between number nine and number 10 with the Golden State Warriors. This is the first time in over three months they've gone up from the number nine spot. And now it's in play with, with the Pelicans and the Kings not playing as well recently with the Lakers going on a tear. Like at this point, the Lakers control their destiny. If they continue to be one of the best home teams in the West and, and beat the Timberwolves and the Warriors and can go out and win at least one of the Grizzlies Pelicans games, like that puts them in a good spot to at least be the eight seed. And if they can win out, including beating the Pelicans, including beating the Warriors, uh, they're putting themselves in a really good spot to potentially even be the seventh seed, host an opponent in the 7-8 game. And then all the while, also decreasing the odds of the Timberwolves moving up to number one and the Nuggets moving down to two or three and potentially either facing the Lakers in round one or at least being on their side of the bracket. Takeaway number two is the perimeter defense has been improving lately. And I thought this was one of the Lakers' better perimeter defensive games uh, in a while. For the second time in a couple weeks, LA has held an opponent under 100 points. And that's notable. To me, the three guys that really stood out were Austin Reeves, Gabe Vincent, and Spencer Dinwiddie. Uh, Austin Reeves held Donovan Mitchell to two of seven shooting as the primary defender. And I think he, he did a really good job of staying in front of him, forcing him into contested jumpers, uh, contesting him from behind. Austin is excellent at rear view contests. That's where sometimes you'll see him get a block or or get a strip. Spencer did an awesome job. He continues to uh, excel defensively and and function as uh, essentially the Lakers glue guy. He just does all the little things of taking on the toughest perimeter assignment, uh, rebounding, boxing out, making the extra pass, Uh, Just being a a smart cutter, uh, knowing where to be offensively in terms of of spacing and pacing and and just all those little things, all those intangibles that don't necessarily show up in the box score, but often show up in in terms of plus minus. And that's why Spencer has been so effective for the Lakers uh, from a plus minus perspective. And then Gabe, I thought Gabe, I thought Gabe did a a really good job against Darius Garland. Uh, He was bothering him. Uh, Gabe is a, a tough defender from a physicality perspective like he's just someone you can't really move if you're a smaller guard Uh, so he did a really good job uh, chasing Garland around screens uh, you know split cuts and uh, just different actions that Cleveland was trying to use to get uh, Darius Garland going Uh, Gabe did a good job shadowing him and making things tough for him. And, and Gabe didn't score. He was just 0 for 2. He's still figuring out his offensive role, his shot. Uh, I think he's a little bit lower in the pecking order than maybe even he was expecting uh, coming back from injury. But the, the Lakers, like with those three guys in particular and the, the identity of this group, uh, like those three have all stepped up defensively. Uh, like Gabe, we know about his defensive reputation. He was a plus defender uh, in Miami, but Spencer was coming off. Like people were saying he quiet quit in Brooklyn and, and just gave up on that team. And he's come in and been a plus defender and for stretches of his Lakers tenure, been the Lakers best perimeter defender. Uh, and then Austin has really stepped up and taken on the challenge of accepting a lesser offensive role and taking on more of the dirty work and and more of the top perimeter assignments and basically said, like, I'm I'm gonna help this starting lineup function because somebody has to play defense out here. And with with four of the five guys, they trend more offensive than defensive. And and the four being uh, LeBron, Rui, Austin, and D'Lo. And someone has to step up. And and Rui has stepped up as well at various points, taking on the Kawhi Leonard's and, and Kevin Durant's and and like the, the primary wing guys. But when it's a guard 
or a, a more perimeter based player, like that's when when Austin has to t- step up and, and, and take on that guy. So I think he's done a really solid job in recent weeks. Again, Tyrese Maxey, Shea Gilgis Alexander, De'Aaron Fox, Steph Curry, like those guys are going to burn him sometimes. They're going to make tough shots on him. Offense always beats defense. But Austin has done as well of a job as is reasonably possible against those guys. And I, I think he deserves a, a bit more praise and, and recognition for his defensive performance in recent weeks uh, while trying to juggle, obviously, being one of the Lakers' top scorers, top playmakers, and just being relied upon. Uh, and he's still f- figuring out the balance, right? Because I, I think naturally we, we see it sometimes with Austin when he's doing some of these other things, it can take a toll on his, his energy, on his legs, uh, and he's not as effective offensively. I think you've seen some of that recently. But I, I think that the Lakers will accept that trade off if it comes with better defense and him helping funnel guys into AD. And it was really the perimeter defense and then funneling those guys into Anthony Davis. A- AD doing his thing. Of course, AD is always the team's defensive captain. He's always the most impactful defender. And he did have three steals, six blocks, and, and was a game changer in the paint. Uh, but I thought LA's perimeter defense allowed AD to stay home more. And it allowed him to to not have to put out fires and, and emergencies at, at different parts of the floor that when, when you just keep AD home and you can funnel guys into him or or just have him closer to the rim, swatting and, and challenging and d- deterring uh, guys from attacking the basket or, or finishing around the basket, like that's when the Lakers defense, uh, I think, has a chance to go from below average or, or even around average at best to uh, potentially you know elite. And you add that with the offense and how great the offense has been lately. And that is a, a winning recipe. And finally, takeaway number three is this is the pace the Lakers need to play with. And I think this was reflected in their 32 fast break points. Uh, it was reflected at different points on the road trip, although, again, playing lottery level teams, uh, most of which were pretty bad defensively, uh, isn't going to quite move the needle the way it does against a Cleveland team that entered this game sixth in the NBA in defensive rating has two plus interior defenders in Jarrett Allen and Evan Mobley, two of the better rim protectors in the league and uh, a player that was one of the finalists for defensive player of the year last year in Mobley. Uh, So doing that against that team, and yes, they have two small guards in the backcourt, two defensive minuses in Donovan Mitchell and uh, Darius Garland. And Max Struess is kind of like an average defender, depending on the matchup. Uh, He's fine, but a lot of the defense is based on Mobley and Allen and and how great they are and and their scheme. Uh, But LA played with great pace in this one. Uh, They got off to a hot start. Both teams were were trading baskets. Uh, But I I just thought LA, even when they were getting scored on, they weren't hanging their heads. Uh, They they weren't pointing fingers or or getting into arguments or discussions or whatever. It was like, let's just go back and and score on them. And the ball movement that they played with in this game, another 30 assist night. There were times when the offense was flowing in such a way that I just don't know how you stop the Lakers when they're in that type of rhythm. Because with the starters, especially you have three 40 plus percent three-point shooters in D'Lo, LeBron, and Rui. You have another plus shooter in Austin who, who's just above league average uh, at around 36%, but a guy teams don't want to help off of. He, he's a guy who, even though his percentage isn't great, teams are still going to respect him at the three-point line. Uh, you have three plus passers and, and playmakers in D'Lo, LeBron, and Austin. Uh, you can even throw AD in the mix sometimes, uh, especially you know for, for a big man and, and passing out of double teams. He's gotten much better in that regard. Uh, you have two guys who put constant pressure in the rim and are, are just otherworldly finishers and, and superstar scorers in LeBron and AD. Another guy in D'Lo who can just get hot at any moment. Uh, and then a couple guys in, in Austin and Rui who are also capable of big performances as we've seen uh, at various points this season and, and in the playoffs. So like you just look at that starting lineup and I don't know, like there's no weakness and they go through different phases where if like Austin Reeves and Rui Hachimura are often your fourth and fifth options in a lineup, that's a pretty damn good offensive lineup. 
And that's what we've seen from this group. And there's just not really a clear place to help off of. If you help off of Rui, like look at look at Memphis's game plan. When, when you help off of Rui, he's going to drop 30 points on you and hit multiple threes. And like he's a, a very rhythm-based player who once he gets in a certain rhythm, it, it's hard to shut that down. So like just the the, the penetration of, uh, you know, uh, even Austin and D'Lo, I thought played downhill for the most part. Uh, D'Lo, uh, again, had a really good start to this game. Uh, had 10 points in the first quarter, 13 in the second. And, and just the, the way the offense w- was flowing, uh, D'Lo w- with his cutting, his back screening, like he's constantly moving offensively. And I think has taken that part of his game to a different level. Uh, Austin making high level reads, LeBron and AD uh, just doing their thing. And, and uh, you know, AD uh, not settling for jumpers and, and really just attacking the Cavs off the dribble. Uh, LeBron playing in pick and rolls and, and ISOs, like just so much offensive firepower with that group. Uh, and then you add in, playing with pace and attacking mismatches and attacking in transition. Like there was 32 fast break points, but that doesn't even uh, count some of the early offense that LA got getting into early offense really just does wonders for the Lakers. So I thought from a pace perspective, this was one of their best uh, games uh, and it worked against them at times. I thought it worked against them in the early third where uh, it just kind of, the, the the turnovers compounded. They had one stretch where they had four consecutive turnovers. They, they had a turnover. Uh, Cleveland scored. They called uh, and tied the game. They called timeout. They had three more turnovers. Cleveland finally got ahead. And then LA responded with a 17-0 run uh, led by AD, who had nine of the 17 points. So to, to me, like this is the way the Lakers need to play offensively. This is the way they need to play defensively as well. Like from, from a two-way perspective, this was one of their best performances uh, in recent memory. I know Cleveland isn't necessarily playing great right now. Donovan Mitchell is still getting reacclimated to the lineup. He had a PRP injection. He was wearing a face mask in this. It seemed like, I mean, he missed a couple of free throws. Uh, like I think he went 0 for 2 on one trip to the line. It didn't seem like himself offensively. And I think it's important to acknowledge those things. It's not like, like, you know, there were some factors in the LA's favor to be clear, but LA took advantage of it, won this game rather convincingly. And outside of that six minute stretch in the third quarter, played a, a pretty good game overall. So that'll do it for today's episode. Thank you guys so much for watching and listening. For those on YouTube, please be sure to hit that subscribe button, hit that notification bell to get notifications for my videos and drop a comment and a like if you enjoyed this one. And for those listening uh, on Spotify, on Apple Podcasts, or your podcast platform of choice, uh, please consider following, downloading, and leaving a five-star review. I'll be back Sunday night after the Lakers game against the Timberwolves. I will talk to you then.